Oh, come on. The name of the Lord of Lords. I can almost hear you. <laughs> the greatest name above all names. And so often we walk right through the day and don't even realize his presence or is, is amongst us in such a powerful way. This sermon begins a series of messages that will lead us up to Easter. We're going to be talking about the days prior to the crucifixion and then we'll get into the crucifixion of Sunday before Easter. And then Easter we'll be talking about the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus who came and gave his life as a sacrifice for the sins of all mankind, including me, praise the Lord, and you, if you should trust him as your Lord and Savior. So this message series, this is not going to be a series of messages like I often do with real clear outlines of three points or four points, an illustration, a poem, and such and such. Uh, this is going to be more narrative as we walk through uh, these next few weeks, this, those last days. And we kind of explain the story and what's going on and look at the different things that are happening prior and the days just before and the implications of those things, deeper meanings of some things that some people in just casual reading will, I believe many times, miss straight away and just not get what's going on. We'll start with the upper room experience this morning as we're talking in our sermon series and the washing of feet and several things that took place in that room, like Judas's first renunciation and walking out of that room uh, right prior to the Lord's Supper. But they're all gathered there in, in the upper room. So this will be an overview series of messages of, of this particular event and this great historical uh, event in time, but also how that historical event still impacts our lives today in a very real and a very genuine way. So uh, I'm hoping that over this next couple of weeks, that even in your own private devotional studies, you'll take some time, turn to the Gospels, read through those accounts of the last days of Jesus from the Lord's Supper on, because that's where we're going to be talking. You'll see that each one of the disciples uh, gives a little, bitty, a little bit different perspective of one event that might not be recorded in another Gospel. And so the Holy Spirit just inspired these men to lay this out before us. But one of the great arching themes that you see through this, obviously besides the dignity and the love, the humility, the fellowship, the grace of Jesus, especially in today's message, it has to do with his humility and his love that expresses such humility. The Bible says in John 13, chapter 1, it says, Having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them to the end. In fact, we're going to be starting with John chapter 13 today. We're going to see how he loved his own and how he loved them to the end. We'll start with the upper room in John 13. Looking at verses 3 through 11, we'll read together this morning. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and he girded himself about. And he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And so he came to Simon Peter, and he said to him, Peter does, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I do, you do not realize now, but you shall understand hereafter. And Peter said to him, never shall you wash my feet. And Jesus answered, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. And for this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. Now, this is the synoptic gospel that tells us that uh, the institution of the Lord's Supper, uh, which John kind of omits in his particular gospel, but the others don't. Uh, he's just mentioning the Passover meal, and it's this implementation right before the actual Lord's Supper. They're taking Passover together during this particular time. It leads, as the other gospels pick it up, to, to more instruction regarding specifically the Lord's Supper and the events regarding the Lord's Supper, the taking of the bread, the taking of the wine. But John includes something in this event in the upper room that the other disciples don't include in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. What he includes here is this issue about Jesus coming in and washing the feet of the disciples. And it is an important issue. Uh, please understand that when Jesus gets here on the scene, it's something he's already set up. He sent the disciples to a specific person. You may be familiar with the story and how that they see this specific man doing a specific task. They know he's the one whom they should ask for a room in which they could receive the Passover meal together. 
Remember the Passover is that meal, which is a memorial meal that the Jews celebrated every year since their deliverance from the land of Egypt, where Moses carries them out in obedience to the Lord. But, but we know also that that Passover meal, which is recorded several times in many places in Scripture, that Passover meal was very prophetically significant. Not only was it a message that God would deliver his people and save them from that disease that would plague the firstborn of all the, all the people in Egypt who did not have blood of a spotless lamb sprinkled over the doorpost. It was prophetic in that it showed that in the future that God would deliver all people and make deliverance available to all people who would have their hearts sprinkled with the blood of an innocent lamb, and that lamb being the Lord Jesus. That Passover meal was filled with so much prophetic pictures uh, of who Jesus is, what he would do, and what he would accomplish for, for people. And now this is, in the Gospels, the last Passover meal that is recorded in Scripture. It, it's the last because it's the fulfillment of what that prophetically portrayed and displayed to the people of the time. So I love this passage. It says, when Jesus arrives at the room, he knew who he was. He, was. he knew he was in full authority. He knew that all things had been given into his hands. He knew what his responsibilities were. And he knew that he came to serve. And he knew he came to offer himself as a sacrifice, to be that Passover lamb for the sins of all mankind. He knew he was. He knew what he was there for. And he knew that he'd come to seek and to save, as Scripture says very clearly, that which is lost. He came to serve. That was his role. He was the suffering servant, but at the same time, he's the Lord of glory. He's the King of kings. He is God in flesh in their midst. And they've seen him on many occasions, more than the scriptures record, him display his deity and display his glory in so many different ways and in so many different fashions. And here they are, maybe not fully realizing what's getting ready to come upon them, even though he'd said enough that this is it, now he's in the last days of his earthly ministry just prior to the crucifixion. He's gathered this, these men. One gospel says, I have earnestly desired to have this Passover with you. Why is he so desirous to have that Passover? Because one, they're his friends. They're the men he's committed to. They're the men whom he's loved. The Bible says he loved his own to the end. But he also knows this is the last Passover meal which needs to be celebrated, that this is the fulfillment of all Passover meals. And he's gathered with them in this room. He knew who he is. He loves these men. They are the very first fruits of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are the ones who will do the beginning work. The foundation stones will be laid by these men. And as he's there gathered together with them, he moves in such humble fashion and does the work of an ordinary common slave or the lowest servant in the house would perform by washing the disciples' feet. Now understand this whole issue about him washing the disciples' feet is quite unique to the Gospel of John. If you study some of the other Gospels, like with Luke and even with Matthew, it says as this begins, that this whole, this whole mealtime starts, that the disciples are having a discussion. And the discussion regards who's chief among us. Who's going to be the greatest when the kingdom comes? Who's going to be up on the high seat? Who's going to be the most recognizable? And they're debating which of them it shall be. And while they're debating this debate, Jesus gets up, takes off this outer garment, wraps himself with the linen and the cloth, takes a bowl of water, fills it, this basin, and begins to do what one of them should have already done and wash the feet of the disciples. But you're not going to see anybody moving with such humility when they've been speaking with such arrogance. I'm the greatest. It sounds like a bunch of guys getting together, doesn't it? <laughs> hey, I'm the greatest. I'm tough. I'll whip anybody here. I'm the greatest, man. I'm, I'm, I'm the top dog of this crowd. I'm the alpha male. And they're so busy wrapped up in that, they forget what this is really all about. And who is in their midst? Who is the greatest is in their midst. And it, it was that it would fall to the disciples, those who specifically were on task and errand by the Lord Jesus to go prepare that room it would fall upon them the task of either washing the feet of those who were the guests that, for that evening meal or, or would, to assign somebody. But there's not anything like that. We just enter in, 
and we enter in with our dirty feet and we enter in to brag about who we are and how important we are and what we've come to and how we've arrived and give ourselves as much credit as possible. Now, foot washing was a necessary evil, if you want to call it that. It's been tried to be made by some groups into a sacrament like the Lord's Supper and foot washing, but the Bible doesn't give it that kind of place. It was really a necessary daily need of people who traveled dirty, dusty roads. There's no asphalt. There's, you know, there, we're not looking at, uh, at concrete streets. Occasionally we'd see cobbled stones along streets and pathways where the Romans worked. But it wasn't the norm. The norm was just dirt and dust. And it wasn't the norm to wear shoes that covered your feet completely. It's more like open-toed shoes and sandals where it's dirty and it's dusty and people trodding through this all day long. In fact, it was common in those days there would be public bathhouses where the men would go to a bathhouse and women would go to a bathhouse and there they would use those facilities for bathing. And upon bathing and getting clean, then you'd make your way back to your, your abode, to your home. And once you got there, guess what the first thing you'd have to do? Go back and wash your feet because they were filthy, because they were dirty. In relationship to having people come into your place, where you were in charge of your home, in this room, the disciples who prepared the room, then it's responsibility of one of them as the guest entered to wash their feet. But nobody's doing that. And it's amidst this discussion, who's going to be the greatest, that Jesus prepares himself, gets up. I mean, I, I bet it gets so quiet in the room. You could probably cut it with a knife. The atmosphere is so thick all of a sudden. Here is the Lord, Rabbi, the great teacher, the master of the group who rises to wash their feet. And I mean, that, and there's not a word spoken until he comes to Peter, which is the norm, <laughs> which we, many of us can relate to. Lord, you wash my feet, and it's an emphatic you. You? In, in, in the Greek language, it, it's, it, there's an emphasis upon that word, the way it's written. So there's no guessing. It's not like reading somebody's text, you know, no. This is, a, this is an emphatic word in the Greek language. You know, you wash my feet? It's like... There's no way. I'm not going to allow you. You know, he gets it here that, hey, I should be the one who should be doing the foot washing. You know, I should be the one here with this responsibility of doing it. But you brings to mind those last words of Jesus in Matthew 20. As you go through those last eight chapters there when Jesus says, you know, the son of man did not come to be served. But the son of man came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And so often there's even a gospel message that goes out in so many ways that teaches just the opposite is that the Lord, you know, now that we've been left to serve, we think we're left to just be saved and be delivered and to be blessed and not to serve. We lost the context of what it means to be the greatest. Well, if you're going to be the greatest, then you have to be the least. If you want to be great, then you've got to be small. If you want to be big, then you've got to lower and you've got to humble yourself. That's the message that in, 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 in actions that Jesus is giving right very clearly to these men. I mean, think about it for a moment. This is God, the Son of God, in their presence, in the room, washing their feet. There was a brilliant young man who was a professor of philosophy at Oxford University many years ago by the name of H.A. Hodges. One day he strolled down the street not too far from the university where he lived. And he passed by an art star, store. And as he looked into the window of that store, he noticed there was, a, was an artistic drawing of this particular biblical incident. Jesus is humbling, kneeling down, washing the disciples' feet with this basin of water. Hodges tells in his own testimony that he wasn't a believer. He's very familiar with Scripture. He'd read the Bible. But he said, I was so gripped by this simple picture it showed Jesus just washing his disciples' feet. Washing. He said, from my understanding of Scripture, I understood that the Bible teaches that Jesus is God, very God in flesh. And here's God washing the feet of humans, humbling himself to the lowliest task among men in that age, in that time. Humbling himself. God washing the feet of humanity. He said, if God's like that, then he shall be my God. And it was that moment in his life that he made a commitment of his heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ and gave himself to Christ. I think sometimes as, as Christians, we just, we take the existence for God as granted. He that comes to God must believe that he is. Well, okay, I believe he is. We just, we just kind of stroll through the Bible, 
And it talks about the eternal spirit of God who has no beginning, you know, and, and no endings. Existence shall never end. And we wonder sometimes about his character, perhaps. If you want to understand the character of this great omniscient, omnipresent God, this, 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 this great creator, father of ours, then you look at Jesus here in humility. I think sometimes we're so busy wondering why God doesn't do something for us, like deliver us from a problem that we're facing, get us away from an illness, deliver us from this situation, this financial thing we might be going, an issue with our family or with our children. Why, God, why don't you, if you really love me, why don't you do something? God has clearly demonstrated his love for us by coming, not just washing the feet, but washing our hearts by surrendering himself is that sacrificial servant for our sins. Nobody else could have done what he did, but, but God himself. And so Jesus comes and does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Boy, if there's a message that seems to need to be gripped again, it's probably just getting a, somehow in our heart and mind this, that, that upper room experience where, you know, where Peter said, Lord, you, you wash my feet. Listen to the words of Jesus. He said, listen, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. In other words, he expresses the necessity that a washing has to happen. Now we know that this is prophetic in so many ways. We know that he's talking to Peter about true cleansing. And he's also making a clear demonstration about servanthood at the same time these men who've been arguing about in, in arrogance and pride. To be socially acceptable for the dinner, you had to have your feet washed. To be spiritually acceptable for God, you have to be washed completely. Now there's been a point already where Peter has made this commitment of his life. And he's made a commitment of faith to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. He has placed his nets down and followed Jesus Christ for three years. And we'll see the intensity of it. Yes, there's a point of departure, but there's also a point of return later where he's in brokenness. And it's really a picture of the Lord says, you know, you've already been bathed once. I don't need to bathe you because it's a great picture of Peter. He's always ready to go whatever the Lord says, you know, when he understands it. Well, Lord, wash, okay. If I don't have any part with you, if you don't wash my feet... And he puts his head down, obviously. You can almost see him reaching out his hand. Saying, okay, wash all me. <laughs> I'll take, give me the whole thing. Pour it on me. Because <laughs> I, I want part of you. I want to be in fellowship with you. I want to walk with you. I want to know you. It's like in the boat when he said, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come to you. I'll come. So there's that, there's that passion when he begins to understand. And the Lord says, hey, I only need to wash your feet. You've already been bathed. Now, the reality of that is it comes clear at the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ when all those prophetic promises of God are fulfilled at the cross about our salvation and our deliverance because they've been made. Peter, prior to the cross, he's moving towards and forwards Jesus in faith. All right. He's walking in faith. He's living a faith life. He's learning what it means to live a faith life. He doesn't need. He's already made a commitment of his life. He doesn't need to be washed whole now, but he does need his feet washed. And a lesson I think is clear for all of us. Once we come to Christ, we are washed completely. But in the daily affairs and walking the streets of our life and the world that we live in, getting the dirt and the dust and the grime and the filth of this culture that we live in the midst of, it gets on us. We voluntarily go places we shouldn't, do things we shouldn't, act in ways we shouldn't. Then it's time to stop and get your feet washed. Amen. That deals with the daily walk of your life. We know as Christians, we're saved. We're delivered. I will enjoy salvation in heaven. Even if I sin today, I'm still going to heaven. But I want you to know, there's a necessity for practical holiness in my walk and in your walk. Practical sanctification, which means that daily I'm willing to surrender my heart. And maybe at the end of this day, I may need a good foot washing. Lord, I, and I think there's a time of introspection we should all make even before we lay our heads on the pillow at night, and before we pass out and sleep. Say, Lord... I want to be clean completely. It's one thing to begin our day, and I think that's where it all starts. It's another thing to end our day with an introspection and say, Lord, hey, uh, if it means there's no part in you, then, then wash me. The object lesson is when we believe, we're made clean. Sometimes in our daily affairs of life, we miss the mark. And so the Lord, he's ministering here in such a clear way, one on humility, but also the necessity for our cleansing. Now we move from this place where Jesus finishes and he places everything aside and he sits down with the disciples and they're, they're involved in the Passover meal itself. And uh, there's, there's this question where Jesus is already, you know, raised in the room by making a statement. A question kind of enters the heart when Jesus says, not all of you are clean. 
I don't need to wash your feet, but there's someone here that needs to be completely made clean. I bet it got real quiet again. I mean, we all have friends and associates. So, you know, what would it be like if I gathered, you know, all the lift leaders here today? And I sit down at a table and says, I know one of you betrayed me. <laughs> Everybody looking around the room. <laughs> It'd be a tense moment, don't you think? You know, if we, if we got the staff, you say, okay, which one of you betrayed me? You know, they're, they're, you can do that in your home with your kids. I know one of you is lying to me. <laughs> you know, think about that in the context of this room, because folks, I mean, somehow transport yourself back there a couple thousand years and let's get in that upper room. All right. It, it's, it's, it's just, there's all that's there is that, that table and those mats for those men and that wash basin in the corners. That's about all the furnishings that we know of. And we know it's not like the, you know, like the, the, the painting where everybody's sitting in portrait style and facing the camera, you know that we've seen that. This is in, in, in the times, it'd be what was known as a triclinium table, which was three-sided table, kind of like a U-shape, and they would be gathered around, and they'd all be able to look at each other and converse with one another across the way. And they'd all be sitting on floor mats or laying in floor mats, reclining at the table. That's what the Bible talks about, reclining at the table. You say, oh, well, I get reclining at the table, my mama give me a whipping. At this table, it was all right. So they're, they're gathered around here, and Jesus says these words as they sit down. He just made the statement, one of you needs to be made clean. I can imagine that the small talk and the small chatter kind of goes out the way. And then listen to these verses. It continues to read down in John 13, verse 21. When Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified, truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. And the disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know which one he was speaking. There was reclining on Jesus' breast one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Now, by the way, let me go back to that one time. Let's just make a reference to that one passage. Would you back that up for me, please? To avert to that. Yeah, thank you. The highlighted part. They began to look at one another. They were at a loss of which to know who Jesus was speaking. Nobody jumped up and said, oh, it's Judas. They had no idea. In fact, the idea is, you'll see in just a moment, they're so at a loss. According to Matthew, several of them asked the question, who is it or is it I? According to John here, it's Peter who leans back on the Lord. But listen to what it says. Simon Peter therefore gestured to Jesus and said to him, he's kind of like, hey, who are you speaking about? And catch this. And leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Matthew and Mark put it this way. Is it me? Is it I? And several of them are asking this question. Jesus, Jesus therefore answers it. It's the one whom I shall dip this morsel and give it to him. And when he dipped the morsel, he took it and he gave it to Judas, Judas the son of Simon Iscariot. Matthew marks it like this. Surely not, Lord. I, is it I? He said, I'll tell you who it is. And he dips that morsel and he hands it to Judas and Judas takes it and leaves. That's the point where he leaves. He leaves during the Passover meal. It's from that point where the Lord's Supper begins to take. But I think it's really a good question because Judas knew it was him. He knew what he'd planned to do. He knew what he was doing. You know, it's a good question ask because even scriptures tell us to ask a question like that. Paul wrote the Corinthians. He said, you know, let every, you know, he said, every one of us said, we should examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. What's he saying? Take a look. Step back. Don't be afraid. I mean, some people don't even want to ask themselves that question. Am I really a child of God? Do I really know Jesus? Am I a Christian? Am I, or am I a betrayer? Have I been in the crowd, walked with Jesus, seen the miracles, been a part of everything going on, said Jesus is Lord, got a bumper sticker that says Jesus is Lord, and still betrayed? Right? It's all, has it all been about me or has it all been about him? Peter goes on later and he writes to the church. He says, let every man make his calling and his election sure. Basically, Scripture is telling us we have this responsibility to make sure that we've made sure, to know that we know to find what it means to know him and to make sure that we have responded to what it means to know him. 
Because it is easy to go through the motions of Christianity, especially in the world that we live in, this Western Hemisphere, to claim the name of Christ, to be in church, to read our Bible, to go through all the motions and still have a heart that's not dedicated. We're living in a world where people, you know, they, they don't make graven images, but they have these mental graven images. If this is what God means to me, forget what the Bible says. I, I don't agree with everything in the Bible, so we'll just push it aside. That's the mindset of a lot of people. Since I don't agree with everything, I can come up with a God of my own making. Uh, and I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and he was a good man, and he died for sins, and that's great. But I think I shared with you a week or two ago uh, a recent uh, article that talked about a poll that was taken among mainline evangelical Christians that 65% of Christians in churches in America today do not believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation. They believe that there are multiple ways to salvation. I would say those folks make your calling an election sure. Because the Bible makes it clear in multiple places, in many places, over and over again, that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him. He says, I am the door, I'm the gate. You know, you don't come to me, you don't get to the Father. It's really clear. I mean, you don't have to guess it. It's not a stretch. It's not some evangelical kind of, you know, fable that's been presented to the world. It says it in black and white. For me to say otherwise is for me to try to attempt to make God a liar. Because if I'm saying there's another way, then I've made God a liar by saying, God, your word's not true. You're, just, you're, you're deceiving people. But the Bible says, let, let man be a liar and let God be true. And God's word is true. And so I think if God's word is true, then we need to be cautious of doing the very thing that Judas did. And that was to go join the group, follow the crowd, be a part of everything until it didn't fit our, 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 our box anymore. When it didn't fit the way I think it ought to work anymore. When I no longer have I chosen to follow Jesus at that point, I've chosen to have my own little mental graven image of what I think Jesus is and what Jesus means and what the Bible means. I, I think we have to be very, very true to the, to the scriptures because the Bible tells it it's by the word of God we have faith. That my faith is bound in, found in, built upon the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So I believe the Word of God. And the Word of God is very clear on this issue of what it means to be saved. I mean, you ask the average person, what does it mean to be saved? It's kind of like, well, I, I, I know I'm saved because I, 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 I prayed the prayer or I got baptized or I was sprinkled, I was confirmed. I went, through, I went through the sacraments of the church or I went through the class. And the class, you know, at the end of the class, we prayed the prayer and I did all that stuff. Remember, we're talking about Judas. Judas is just one of the guys. To you, the name Judas brings up all kinds of things and betrayer and traitor and wicked. But hey, back then it didn't mean that, you know, it's almost a derivation of Jesus. He's about the same age as Jesus. He's a Judah. He most likely has performed miracles if we believe the Bible. The Bible said he sent out those disciples along with 70 some of them, they go out and they perform miracles. They come back, they're excited. We saw you, we, we saw Satan fall from heaven. We saw great things, we saw miracles. We saw people raised, we saw people healed. We saw, you know, blind people could see, deaf people could hear, lame people could walk. They saw the actual demonstration of miracles. But what a tragedy to be there, be in the midst of it, be so close to it and still not embrace it. I mean, there's not a lot of testimony here that they knew it was Judas even. I mean, he's the treasure. He's so trusted they've made him the treasure for the group. So how do you resolve that issue? Lord, is it I? I think the only reliable source is, 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 is the Lord and his word. Have I believed what the Bible says? Have I put my faith in Jesus Christ and upon the promises he's given of salvation? I think it's that same prayer that David prays in, in an Old Testament sense when he says, Lord, search me. See if there be any wicked way in me. Don't let any deceit come in my heart. I, I want to be true. I want to be the real deal. I don't want to kind of approach you with my own little list. So here's what I think it means to be saved. Tear that list up. There's already a list given. And it simply means I put my faith. I'm looking for no other deliverance, no other salvation, no other way out and way in other than Jesus Christ. He's our hope. He's our life. I think the people who fail are people who, who fail to ask. And people sometimes fail to ask because they know the answer. And their pride gets in the way. That's when Paul is talking about this incident later in 1 Corinthians when he's talking about it. He said, he said, the Lord revealed to me what took place that night in the upper room. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, remember, he says, let me tell you what the Lord showed me. And as he's talking about that incident and the Lord's Supper and what it means to take and how their hearts need to be right, he said, listen, and I believe Judas is in mind when he writes this to us. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged of the Lord. You know, can we ask ourselves the real question? Can we examine our own heart? Can we look and say, do I really know Jesus Christ? Has there ever been a time when I put my life in his hands? Has there ever been a time when I chose to follow him? Has there ever been a time when I said, no longer me, but thee, I'm going to follow you, Jesus. It's a point of, of repentance and faith where I depart one thing and follow another way. That's life. Now, this, this, and you talk about getting tense now. Can you imagine how? Loud that door sounded when Peter walked out. I mean, when Judas walks out of the room. Or even if it's just a cloth doorway covering it, I bet there was a loud whoosh. And I believe stark silence fell on the whole place. This wasn't a happy meal <laughs> at first. But it's a meal that's so sacred and so special that Jesus said, I want you to do this. And as often as you do this, remember me. That it's, it's, it's though that everything that's unwhole and incomplete and unbelieving has to get out of the room for it and out of hearts first. And I believe this is an opportunity for Judas to get right, to swallow his pride and, and to do the right thing. Now, this is a prophetic fulfillment when Jesus is talking about here in this upper room. As Judas Iscariot walks out and, and continues the process of betrayal, there's an Old Testament passage in Psalms 41 that says this, and it's, it is prophetic. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate bread, has lifted up his heel against me. We've talked about Judas in years past and sermons past, but I, I personally don't believe that he, was, he, he had it in his mind to be, to be a betrayer in the beginning. I think he saw an opportunity is what it was all about. I think it was always about himself, but you don't really see it. I mean, the Lord gives him the office of treasure. But the problem with Judas was that there was a problem with his heart. An unbelieving heart, an uncommitted heart. He was more in love with the world. And I believe the prestige that Jesus could bring because there was a great time of popularity. When the people, even as they come into Jerusalem, the people want to make Jesus king. On that last ride into town. But his heart's not surrendered. And folks, if your heart's not surrendered, then you're without Christ. You need to have a heart that's in the hands of God. Somewhere, though, in this process, as God begins to reveal that to Judas, because we know the grace of God to speak to our hearts and reveal our hearts to us, Judas doesn't want to hear it. I think it becomes most obvious when Mary is pouring out that expensive ointment as an act of worship on Jesus' feet. You remember the story. She goes in there and she has this costly perfume, this anointing, and, and she, she pours it out as an act of worship on the Lord Jesus and on his feet. Instead of praising the Lord for this beautiful and expensive and elaborate, gracious, lavish gift upon Jesus as an act of love for Jesus, Judas responds real negatively. Oh, we could have, that's some expensive stuff, man. We could have, we could have sold that and put that in the ministry. We could have used that. He didn't understand what ministry was even. It was worship. And he pours, out, he pours out his mouth at this point and exposes himself. I believe when Jesus at this point just, he basically says, hey, what this woman has done will be remembered throughout all time. And by the way, we're talking about it today, right? <laughs> It'll be remembered forever because of the beauty, because it's elaborate, because it's expensive, because it represented surrender. I'm not holding anything back. Nothing more important to me than you. It represents what real worship is. This is the point, I think, that it, you know those words had to penetrate the heart of Judas. And this is his opportunity to say, hey, I repent, I get, I get right, I'm, but there's no repentance here. And now he's with the, Jesus is with his, his, the last gathering with his disciples. And there they are, but there's no repentance here. In John 13, 26, when Jesus said, when I dip this morsel and give it to him, that's the one who will betray me. He took it and he gave it to Judas. 
But there's no repentance there. He could have fell on his face and broke. And here comes the hard part, folks. The hard part, you know, sitting in that room, surrounded by those men, Jesus sops that bread. Every eye is looking at him. Because we've already been asked, is it me? Is it you? Who is it? Takes that dripping bread and hands it across to Judas. That's a very telling moment, would you not say? <laughs> a very gripping moment. Judas leaves. Judas should have surrendered. He should have broke. Now Satan has entered his heart. He's made a decision. And Jesus, you know, this is, this is a, a, a denunciation. It's, it's a woe that's pronounced and denounced here. And it, it's announced over in Matthew when he says, you know, it'd been better if you'd never been born, Judas. Because he gives a little broader picture of the conversation in the book of Matthew. It'd been better that you'd never been born than betray the Son of Man. That's, you know, there's a lot of hard statements in Scripture. I mean, you think about it. God has offered us such a beautiful escape, a beautiful deliverance and salvation from, from, from wrath. You know, because there's clearly two roads. There's, the Bible makes it clear. That there's a road leading to destruction and there's a road leading to deliverance. And you're going to make, it's going to be destruction or deliverance. And you're going to make a decision which road you're on. You can't go back and forth. You get on one and you live on that road and you walk on that road. And Judas has the opportunity, but he doesn't do it. He chooses his course. There's a passage in Deuteronomy, which is, which is really strong at this point. It says, cursed is he who does not confirm the words of the law by, by doing them. And the people shall say Amen. In other words, God's saying the word is given to us for us to do the word. And if we believe the word, then we'll have the actions that follow. Remember the story in John chapter 3, we get that beautiful passage, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And we see such a clear message in red letters of the great love of God for a lost world. But when that, that discourse carries out with Nicodemus, whom those words were spoken to, really to all of us, but to Nicodemus specifically, he says, listen, he who believes in the son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Those are the words that, verses that a lot of people just don't want to read or they exclude them because they don't want to think about it. If you find yourself, they say, well, I'm not sure about that. That seems rough. That seems difficult. Listen, I don't understand the eternal justice of God any more than I understand the eternal love of God. But there is a balance between those and the sovereignty of God. I mean, God, God's telling Judas here, you know, th this is that part where, where the wrath of God. In Acts, remember the story where the disciples are, are, are speaking and then this guy named Elamus, the magician, comes and he, you know, he wants what they, they have. He says in Acts, he said, listen, you are full of deceit and you're full of fraud. You're a son of the devil. You're the enemy of all righteous. You will not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord. Those are hard words, are they not? I don't want those words to be spoken to me. But listen to the words of Jesus to Judas in that upper room is recorded in Matthew. The Son of Man is to go just as written him, but woe to him the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Woe. When the Lord says woe, when scriptures record that, it, it means that, that there's no hope, that there's no peace. Those, those are harsh, difficult words. Those words will not only be heard by Judas. The Bible describes a day when, when men will stand before God and there will be a religious group that approach the throne and they'll say to him, Lord, Lord, didn't we do many mighty works in your name? Now here's the religious people he's talking about. Like Judas, they're religious. They've been with the group. They've seen it. They've tasted it. You know, they've been around it. They, they know what's going on. They understand the, 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 the biblical terminology. They're the group that laughs at Donald Trump when he says two Corinthians. Because we all know all evangelicals say second Corinthians. You know, they're the ones who know the difference between two Corinthians and second Corinthians. And they come in and they're talking about all they have done in the context of works. Now be very careful because we know the scripture makes it clear that not by works is any man saved. It's God's grace through faith. I made my heart available to God. He took that heart that's available to him and he washes it and cleanses it. The grace of God. My Savior is Jesus. And he says, you know, the, basically the Lord says, 
Depart from me. He's talking to this religious group. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Now, what's going on here? Because they just told us they're not workers of iniquity, right? What did they tell us? They're workers of good deeds. They've done good things. They've fed the poor. They've clothed the needy. They've, done, they've seen supernatural things. They may have experienced some supernatural gifts. But one thing's lacking. A heart. A heart that brings you into a relationship. Listen to the words again. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. He doesn't say I knew you once and said I don't know you. And I knew you again, but you got right, so I guess I know you now. And then I don't know you, so what did you do? Well, you realize you didn't know you, so I need to get saved again. No, that's not all that in and out salvation stuff. It's, even though Peter departs later, the Lord already told Peter, you've been washed, you just need your feet clean. He still makes a terrible mistake, denies the Lord. But you can tell his heart's with God because he comes back and he's broken and he's repentant before the Lord. Where Judas never does that. Not that he's perfect or that you're perfect or anybody gets saved becomes perfect in that moment. But the issue here is an issue of the heart where I get to get down and say, I don't want that. I don't want it to be said to me, it'd been better if I'd never been born. I know some of you people think on a lot deeper scale and you've already, your mind's already gone to, well, if the Lord said to Judas it'd been better if he'd never been born, then why'd he let him be born? And if God is sovereign, then if he did let him be born, why didn't he have Mary raise him as a baby? <laughs> or whatever else your mind wants to go to. To stop the moment. God has put it in your hands, folks, to make a decision. I don't care what theologians tell you. You have a choice to make. There's a place to believe or not believe. To believe means to surrender. To believe means to follow. To believe means to commit. You have to make a decision. It's never wrong to have a point of doubt in your heart about your salvation. It's what you do with that doubt. Will you really take it to heart and say, Lord, examine me. Like David said, see if there's, I, I don't want to be this person. And then come to the place that says, hey, to be saved means to, to surrender my life to the only one who can save me, and that's Jesus. And to follow him. That's what I've done. That's what I've done. It's not just about hanging around with religious folks about hanging around with Jesus. We said last week, John said, we have written these things because we want you to have fellowship with him as well. Remember from the outside, Judas looks like everybody else in the group. He eats with them, looks like them, walks with them. But all those things can mask over your lust, your pride, your selfishness, your unbrokenness. It's like a mantle that you can wear over all those things in your life. Religion is. I think we need to get the point to place to look at our own hearts and say, Lord, is it I? To realize, hey, I can realize that I can fail and I can stumble, but I know that I know. It's like Paul said, I know whom I've believed in, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed Amen. because I'm committed to him. And I, there has been a moment perhaps of straying, but I've, I've come back to the Lord, and I've always come back whenever there's been those moments because I love Jesus with all my heart, all my mind, all my soul. He's real to me. It's real to me. It's not about religion. It's not about church. It's not about religious works. It's about a relationship. What was, the, what was the indictment? Jesus said, I never knew you. He knows every one of us. But to know us in that sense means to have fellowship, relationship in our hearts and life. You know, as you study scripture, the Bible makes it clear that there's two books that God has in his library. One is called the book of life. And it tells us that if, if you've been born, you breathe air, you've lived, and your name's been recorded in the book of life. All right? But there's another book that John the Revelator gives us and tells us of that God speaks to him about and shows him while he's in heaven. And that book is called the Lamb's Book of Life. Everyone who's been born is in the first book, the book of life. Everybody who's been born again, their name is written in the Lamb's book of life. This was the issue with Nicodemus. Nicodemus, you've been born and you're religious and you're kind of on to the whole God thing. You're not far, but you still hadn't stepped in. You don't want to miss heaven by just not stepping in. You want to have made a decision in your life that you know. And you're not afraid to ask yourself. You're not afraid to examine your decisions and your choices and your, and your passion. Get past the point, well, I prayed the prayer. Are you following Jesus? Get past the point that I, I was baptized. 
I was baptized two or three times, I think. I forgot. <laughs> I was really only baptized once. True baptism is after you've made a heart commitment to Jesus Christ. Have you ever made that heart decision? Well, if there's anything that you approach, you know, where the disciples were approaching and Jesus has taken them and where all this story is leading them, I hope is if they're heading for the cross. You have to come to the cross in your own life. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, what it means to be saved? Deny yourself. Embrace the cross of Jesus and follow him. If that's not happened, usually there's only one reason. Many times it's just our pride. We'd rather put our, our faith in our efforts, our faith in our works, and our faith in what we do instead of our faith in Jesus Christ and his word. Today, we're going to give an invitation. And I would say to you very clearly, don't be that guy like Judas who walks out of this building today knowing what you need to do and not, not doing it. It would have been better if you had not been born. Be that person who seizes this moment, who takes the opportunity that God in his mercy and his grace has given you again and receive the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. Trust him as your Lord and Savior. You say, well, Brother Joe, I've already done that. I know that Christ is in my life. But what about you in that foot washing? What about you in the soiled life that's been taken up because you've not come to the Lord and confessed those things that have been going on in a part of your life? Have humility of heart. The Bible says if we confess our sins, God's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. But folks, the if is the word there. Well, I can come over and say, Lord, my life's dirty because my walk is not what it's supposed to be. I need, I, need, I need a cleansing. Wash my heart. I know that I know you. I know that I know you. But wash me. Cleanse my heart and life. Let's stand with our heads bowed.